Military coups, often bloody, without a doubt illegal, and typically detrimental to democracy, are the bleakest manifestation of civilian military relations. Between 2000 and 2019, 31 different states saw military coups, accumulating to more than 50 attempts in total. It's so common that in 2021, this fitness instructor in Myanmar accidentally recorded a coup unfolding while live streaming her workout class. <laughs> So what's a democratically elected leader to do in a world where the military can simply use its monopoly on violence to seize power? I think a logical starting point is first understanding what a military coup is. Britannica defines a coup d'etat as the sudden, violent overthrow of an existing government by a small group, but for our purposes that small group is the armed forces. Military coups are a direct threat to civilian rule, aka control of the government by civilians or elected leaders. A disgruntled military will challenge the civilian leadership's legitimacy, or at worst, seize control of the government and establish military rule. It's a no-brainer that military rule is bad, but I think it's important to mention that empirical studies have found that military-led governments have a higher likelihood of mishandling the economy, violating human rights, and starting wars when compared to civilian governments. Even famed military generals Sun Tzu and Karl von Clausewitz wrote that the military merely serves the state acknowledging that civilian leadership is preferable to that of the military. So in summary, civilian rule good, military rule bad, okay? Cool. That leaves governments with a unique dilemma. The military's monopoly on the use of violence is necessary for security against external threats, however it can become a detriment to the state if the military decides to take up arms for whatever reason and replace the civilian government. Political scientist Peter Favor calls this the civil military problematique a paradox where the very institution created to protect the polity is given sufficient power to become a threat to the polity. This presents two distinct issues. In mature democracies, the military is typically under the control of civilians and focused on external defense. However, when the military is highly respected, believes its ability to fulfill its mission is threatened, or has concerns about civilian leadership, civilians may struggle to assert their authority in military decision making. In these cases, the test is whether civilians are able to maintain their supremacy in deciding national security policy. In new or unstable democracies, where there is limited experience with civilian control or the military is primarily concerned with maintaining internal order, the challenge is greater. These countries must prevent the military from attempting a coup or otherwise interfering in politics. Okay, now that we're done with our brief theory lecture, how are military coups categorized? Well, there are many factors that go into the planning and execution of military coups, like what section of the officer corps initiated it, the level of violence used, the coup's goals, the military's political leanings, national ethnic tensions, I could go on all day, so it's pretty hard to separate them into categories. Despite this, political scientist Samuel Huntington divided military coups into three generally accepted types. Breakthrough coups, which are characterized by fundamental political change like the replacement of the governing elite or a complete change in political system. These are initiated by non-commissioned or junior officers and utilize varying levels of violence. Veto coups, which occur when the military steps in to prevent fundamental political change as a result of mass social mobilization and political participation. These tend to be the most bloody coups as the military must confront a broad oppositional force. And guardian coups, which operate under the justification as being necessary to eliminate corruption and improve public order. That motivation isn't quite true at times. These are usually led by senior officers and can also result in fundamental political change. It would be crazy to call these comprehensive categories since not all coups fit neatly into a single type and there are many ways to measure them, but I'll still provide some examples of each. Greece's 1967 coup d'etat is an example of a breakthrough coup since it was led by a group of colonels and replaced the country's democratically elected leader with a brutal military junta. At the same time, breakthrough coups can also usher in democratic reforms or civilian rule, like in Egypt's 1952 coup, where low-ranking combat officers deposed King Farouk and established a republic. Chile's 1973 coup d'etat is considered a veto coup since it was instigated in response to the fear of reforms following the democratic election of socialist president Salvador Allende. But you can also throw in a little bit of US meddling there too. President Allende was killed in the assault on the presidential palace, along with thousands of citizens detained or killed shortly after the coup. Egypt's 2013 coup is arguably a guardian coup, 
The military's emphasis on its actions against President Mohamed Morsi as necessary for the good of Egypt was a driving factor for its success, even though the coup did not necessarily establish a more democratic and less corrupt government. The address of the president yesterday and before the expiry of the 48th ultimatum did not meet the demands of the masses of the people. As a result, it was necessary for the Egyptian armed forces, based it on its historic and patriotic responsibility, to consult with certain political and uh, social figures without sidelining any party, where the meeting parties agreed upon a future roadmap plan. The military removed President Morsi in a matter of days, and General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was installed as president. While a survey conducted by Basira, a public polling agency in Egypt, found that 69% of Egyptians disapproved of Morsi, Sisi's rule can only be categorized as authoritarian due to rampant corruption, the detainment of political rivals and protesters, and greater restrictions on NGOs. Just like there isn't a clear criteria to categorize coups, there isn't a straightforward set of conditions that allow us to predict them since the drivers of military coups vary from country to country. However, more often than not, they occur in states with intense political rivalries, a history of ethnic tensions, resource shortages, poverty, and government corruption. These are typically unstable democracies or former autocracies where the military is largely focused on internal order instead of external security, and civilian control of the armed forces is not strong. These two essential factors, combined with whatever relevant economic, political, or ethnic cleavages, amplify the propensity of a military coup. Interestingly enough, several political scientists have found that nations with a historically large number of coups are more likely to undergo coups in the future, and have called this phenomenon the coup trap. This is often the best predictor for future coups. For example, Thailand has had 20 coups since the turn of the 20th century, with the most recent in 2014. It's like Pandora's box. Chaos is let loose and you can't put everything back to normal. So then what can be done to prevent military coups? Let's start with establishing civilian rule, specifically how to create a military structure that fosters and respects democratic values to the best of its abilities. The first thing states can do is legally codify the military as subordinate to its government, particularly to the entire government and people, and not solely just the incumbent executive. For example, Egypt's 1971 constitution directly states that the military owe their allegiance to the people, which isn't an empty statement since the Egyptian military has stepped in to restore order during times of political or economic instability on several occasions. Additionally, many nations have laws that punish coups as acts of treason or sedition that serve as deterrents. And let me tell you, there is no shortage of individuals who faced harsh punishments for trying to remove their leaders from power. The legislature is a more active check on the military since it creates the policies that determine the size, recruitment practices, funding, and overall activities of the armed forces. In a perfect democratic world, that accountability to the legislature implies accountability to the people. The military also has a greater motivation to remain accountable to the state and its people if it is demographically representative of the society it's bound to protect. Sociologist Morris Janowitz suggests mandatory service as a means to do so, since it ensures equal recruitment across ethnicities, religions, race, and political creed. Mandatory service may be a bit too far for some, so the military structure and recruitment policies may be reformed to strategically prioritize diversity. For example, when India gained independence in 1947, the British left the country with a military primarily composed of Sikhs from the Punjab region. Despite comprising of less than 2% of India's population by 1951, they were extremely overrepresented in the armed forces. Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru immediately diversified the military by combining units composed of different ethnic groups into single battalions so that it would reflect the plurality of religions and ethnic groups in Indian society. But on a more practical level, this prevented the clustering of individuals from similar ethnic or religious backgrounds in the same battalion or high levels of power. The final component of civilian rule is defining the power-sharing relationship between civilian leaders and the military. Going back to Samuel Huntington, he proposed what he calls objective civilian control as a framework to delineate the responsibilities of politicians and the military in regards to national security and foreign policy. Objective civilian control stipulates that the citizens' decision-making process determines the state's security policy and goals, while the military remains autonomous enough to determine the operational methods and missions in achieving those security objectives. 
According to Huntington, objective civilian control is indicated by military professionalization and the corresponding recognition of the boundaries of their professional roles, minimal intervention of the military in politics and of politicians in military affairs, and approval from the civilian leadership of the military's professional authorities and autonomy. Probably the best example of this in action we can see that's not behind the scenes of military operations is the U.S. President's State of the Union Address. The Joint Chiefs of Staff strategically determine when to applaud the President as they remain silent during politically charged statements. We must modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it, but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation or anyone else. But when they finally find something neutral, they get up to applaud, and rather hesitantly. I am proud to report that the coalition to defeat ISIS has liberated very close to 100% of the territory just recently held by these killers in Iraq and in Syria and in other locations as well. This signifies a professional military that recognizes its boundaries, specifically in terms of abstaining from political discourse and its role simply as the implementation mechanism of national security policy. These steps are usually enough in stable democracies. However, more direct coup-proofing measures are necessary for new democracies or nations without a history of civilian control. Returning to newly independent India, Prime Minister Nehru spied on his own military apparatus to know if a coup was on the horizon. Although Nehru took links that could be argued undemocratic, such as wiretapping and censoring the postal service for certain generals, it could be asserted that the civil-military problematique warrants an exception to democratic norms in order to sustain democracy as a whole. Some leaders, usually authoritarians, bypass this whole spy thing by just installing loyalists in top military positions. This can have detrimental effects to military effectiveness since appointed leaders are usually militarily incompetent. For example, the USSR's Great Purge removed any military official Joseph Stalin perceived as a political threat. And you know what happens when you get on Stalin's bad side. This is the Gulag. In here, you fight to win back your life. This resulted in the removal of most army generals, admirals, and army commissars. Their replacements fit Stalin's political criteria but had little in the way of commanding experience. The final line of defense against a military coup, and usually present in authoritarian regimes, is a counterbalancing fighting force that operates independently from the military chain of command. Depending on the arrangement, this separate fighting force may be under a Ministry of Interior or report directly to the executive. The idea is that by dividing its coercive power among multiple competing institutions, the state's counterbalancing force can resist a coup in case the regular military defects against the regime. Examples range from Rome's Praetorian Guard, who served as the Emperor's personal bodyguard, to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is intended to protect the country's Islamic Republic political system, as directed under the Constitution. It's important to note that dividing the state's coercive power also implies diverting resources away from the regular military, which can actually increase the likelihood of new coup attempts since it brews resentment among military leaders. But when a coup d'etat is inevitable, fighting back may be the only way out.